This time we can see that an example in which the integral requires the deformation of the contour which comes across the singularities of the integrand. The situation is in fact quite typical in complex analysis and we need to understand how to deal with this case. So the integral in question is as follows. From 0 to plus infinity, log x divided by x squared minus 1 dx. A quick look at the integrand show us that it has many similarities with the previous example. In particular, its single-valued part, let's call it g of x, 1 over x squared minus 1, is an even function of x. And this immediately tells us a possible deformation of the contour. But before discussing the possible deformation, let's have a quick look at the integrand function itself. So for brevity, let's denote that f of z. Obviously, the denominator has zeros, and it means the potential singularities of the function itself at points z equals plus minus 1. So let's investigate the behavior of our function in the vicinity of point z equals 1. Besides, this point lies on the contour itself, so we should do it anyway. Before doing this, however, we need to clarify what we mean by the logarithm of positive number. Well, as usual, logarithm of positive number is understood to assume its arithmetic values. So, log of x is real for positive x. Next, f of 1 plus epsilon equals log of 1 plus epsilon divided by 1 plus to epsilon plus epsilon squared minus 1. Expanding the log function in nominator and denominator, we obtain epsilon over 2 epsilon, which gives us 1 half. So indeed, our integrand is well defined at point z equals 1. But what about point z equals negative 1? Alright, this point doesn't belong to the contour, but usually it's a good idea to investigate all the singularities of our integrand, since we are going to deal with its properties in the entire complex plane anyway. But before doing this, let's define the log of negative numbers. To deal with the negative arguments of the log, we need to draw a branch card and to pick up some regular branch. So the branch card, as usual, should be drawn in the direction of the contour, meaning from 0 to plus infinity. The contour itself now should be pulled slightly upwards or downwards. We choose the upward deformation and equate our original integral with this new contour one. So now our integral is equal to the log of x plus i0 divided by x squared minus 1 dx. And this step automatically fixates the regular branch of our log function. So log of x plus i0 is real for positive x. Now we can find the value of our log function on the real negative semi-axis. And here is a quick life hack. To explain the log function in the complex plane, always use the formal definition of the Taylor series. So log of minus 1 plus epsilon is equal to log of minus 1 plus the derivative of the log at point z equals negative 1 times epsilon, which yields log of negative 1 plus 1 over z at point z equals negative 1 epsilon. And we have log of negative 1 minus epsilon. Now we need to compute the log of negative 1. We proceed along the standard lines. We pick up some reference point slightly above the branch cut, x0 plus i0, and connect it with point negative 1 by some smooth contour. The change of the argument of the log is pi. And we write down the standard formula. Log of negative 1 equals log of the modulus of the ratio negative 1 and x0 plus i0 plus the log of x0 plus i0 plus i pi. 
we cancel out log of x not plus i0. And the modulus of negative 1 is 1, and the log of 1 is 0. So we obtain predictable i pi. Now the expansion of the nominator for our function is done, and we can perform the full expansion. f of minus 1 plus epsilon equals i pi minus epsilon divided by 1 minus 2 epsilon plus epsilon squared minus 1. And retaining only the leading singular terms, we obtain minus i pi divided by 2 epsilon. So we see that our integral does in fact have a singularity at point z equals negative 1. This singularity is nothing but a simple pole, the first order pole. And after all these preliminary remarks, we can proceed with the closure of the contour. As we pointed out earlier, the evenness of the single valued part of our integrand hints us that this should be an opened up dumbbell. But let's have a closer look at its left leg, the leg which extends from zero to minus infinity. We see that at this point it crosses the singularity point z equals negative one. That's why it was so important for us. Of course, this crossing is impossible in complex analysis and we should circumvent it somehow. So we have two choices either to circumvent it with their upper semicircle or with the lower one. A particular choice doesn't make any difference for the answer. So we choose the upper semicircle. And now we can draw the full closure of the contour. Unlike the previous cases, it consists of four parts. The left leg now consists of two parts. The first part is the split integral from minus infinity to zero, which is nothing but the principal value integral. Then there is a semicircle round uh, point negative one. Then there is a, a right leg of our contour, which is nothing but our initial integral, c plus. And then there are two semicircular integrals round the origin and round the circle CR. So this time we have three semicircular integrals. So make a guess which one of them doesn't vanish. Well, obviously the integral round point z equals negative one is special because the function itself has a pole there. So I leave it up to you to prove that the integrals round the origin and round the large semicircle actually vanish. So our closed contour integral is now reduced to the combination of three terms. The first term is simply c plus. The second term is the principal value integral from minus infinity to zero. And the third term is the upper semicircular integral round point negative one. And at this point we make a short break. We still need to perform two more operations. We need to express our original integral via this closed contour integral and then we need to compute the closed contour integral itself using the residue theorem.